Here they come. Quick, turn off the TV and radio. Turn off the lights. Go hide in the back room of the house. They're coming. Yes, this very scene scares grown adult Christians. They'd rather go through a root canal than to see two men walk up to their porch. And if the Jehovah's Witnesses ever made it through the front door, the average American Christian would faint or have a heart attack. Even some of you right now seeing this image are starting to have a cold sweat and your blood pressure went up. You talk about a scary Halloween costume. The reason most Christians are scared of a Jehovah's Witness is because the JW will quote all kinds of scripture at you, and the average American Christian is painfully ignorant of the Bible. So to help you out, I'm going to take away your fear of them. Instead, I hope to replace it with a genuine concern for them. I want you to feel sorry for them. Then maybe you'll develop a desire to see the Jehovah's Witnesses get saved. Maybe you'll feel sorry for them when you find out how much paperwork they have to fill out. You yourself don't like to fill out paperwork. First off, the JW must fill out a time report. How much time they spend doing Jehovah's Witnesses type of work. Do you as a Christian punch a time clock now? Imagine having to give me a progress report on a weekly basis. Next up is the memorial report. The memorial is their version of communion. Even though Jesus said, do this often in remembrance of me, they only do it basically once a year. So let's get a close up of that card. The JW that is conducting the event must let their headquarters know how many attended and how many, if any, partook of the communion. You say, what does that mean? Well, the JW show up and talk about the Last Supper of Christ, and then they pass the trays around, but they don't drink and they don't eat. They just pass it down the row, which of course is ridiculous. They say that only the first 144,000 saints are supposed to partake. And when the JWs were just starting out back in the 1800s, they didn't have that many members, but after a few decades or so, they soon had more than 144,000 JWs, so they teach that those first 144,000 go to heaven when they die. And over the years, most of them have died. There's a few of them still around, but the rest of the JWs that live today, when they die, will only live on the new paradise earth, so they teach. At their yearly memorial service, nobody is supposed to eat or drink the communion. But if someone does, they have a workaround for that. Every once in a while, one of their members will feel something. They'll declare, I've got a, a burning in the bosom or something. Well, maybe it's just indigestion, but every now and then one of them feels led to partake of the drink and the bread. If and when that happens, they declare that one of them has just joined the special 144,000 club. You say, how can that be? According to them, the first 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses became the chosen ones that will live in heaven, and that number is already fixed. So they had to come up with a workaround, basically a new revelation. They say that, well, one of those original 144,000 saints that already died must have done something wrong up there in heaven by now, and they've gotten kicked out of heaven, making room for a new lucky individual. So if one of their own drinks and eats at the memorial service, they have to report that. And here is their territory map card. I, I hope you're starting to feel sorry for them. They are too confused and don't know how to interpret scripture, but they also have to fill out this territory map card. Each neighborhood is mapped out, so each person will be reached with their message. This is their publisher identification card. Each Jehovah's Witness is called a publisher. They must pass out their information. They must pass out their magazines that they print. Now, this is their blood card. Each Jehovah's Witness must carry this card in case they are in an accident because they are not allowed to receive blood transfusions. A full-time door-to-door worker is called a pioneer. They report directly to the Watchtower headquarters in New York. They're kind of a class above the average JW, and there's an even higher class 
It's a special pioneers. The special pioneers get paid for their door-to-door -door work. Up next is the disfellowshipping report card. When Jehovah's Witnesses are shunned or disfellowshipped, they're kicked out of their group because of breaking any of the rules or laws, the sin is recorded on their secret file after appearing before a disciplinary committee, also called a judicial committee. The report is recorded on this card and sent to the headquarters in Brooklyn, New York. Now let's talk about some of the things they believe. Number one, they believe that God is not part of any trinity and that that type of doctrine was obviously inspired by the devil. They also teach that Jesus is not to be worshipped or prayed to. They'll tell you that he is only an angel, basically Michael the archangel, or he's just a man. And Jesus Christ is a created being, according to them, who at one time did not exist. They also teach that the Holy Spirit is not a person, but is God's active force. They remove all the personality out of the Holy Spirit. Now, my Bible calls the Holy Spirit the Comforter. A comforter is a personal attribute, so the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible changes the word comforter to helper. And here you have my Bible on the left in John chapter 14 calling the Holy Spirit the Comforter. And in the middle, here is the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible downgrading the Comforter to a mere helper. And guess who joined the Jehovah's Witnesses? All of the modern versions fall in line to join up with the Jehovah's Witnesses. We, we wouldn't want them to feel like they weren't part of us, would we? Some of you might remember that old song about the comforter. The comforter has come. We, we used to sing that song a lot. Can you imagine singing the helper has come? Just really rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? More things they believe. Heaven is hope only for select Jehovah's Witnesses. The majority of JWs hope to live on paradise earth after the earth is destroyed. They also think that heaven is limited only to 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. And there's about 9,000 of them still alive today. That number may be smaller. My information is a couple years old here. The Jehovah's Witnesses are the only true Christians, according to them, and all churches and denominations are considered false religions. And they teach that there is no hell or eternal judgment. They say all is well, there is no hell, and, and anytime you see the word hell or anything like that, that just simply means the grave. They don't understand doctrine. They teach that Jesus' second coming happened invisibly and secretly in 1914, and that Jesus did not rise from the dead bodily, but as a spirit being. And they teach that Jesus is equal to Adam, meaning that he's just a man. They are forbidden to serve in the military. They are forbidden to run for or hold a political office. They are forbidden to vote in any political campaign. And they are forbidden to serve on a jury. Now, don't let that last one tempt you to join them. I'm just joking, of course, but these are things they're not allowed to participate in. They are forbidden to speak to former members who are shunned or disfellowshipped. They are forbidden to purchase Christian products like a book or a music. They are forbidden to read Christian literature. They are forbidden to have friends who are not Jehovah's Witnesses. They are forbidden to marry a non-Jehovah's Witness. Now, if one of them is already married and they become a Jehovah's Witness, they don't mind that so much, but you're not to go out and pursue getting married to somebody else because that other person might try to talk you out of being a Jehovah's Witness. And all their rules are basically designed to protect the Jehovah's Witnesses from outside thoughts and ideas. They are forbidden to donate blood or their organs. They are forbidden to read any anti-Jehovah's Witnesses material. They are forbidden to attend the funeral of an ex-Jehovah's Witness. They are discouraged to be a police officer. They must read and study Watchtower literature regularly. They have to purchase it. It's kind of like a weird pyramid scheme. The more JWs you get, the more people purchase your materials and the more money you make. 
They must go from door to door weekly to gain converts. They must attend five meetings per week. Jehovah's Witnesses go to special buildings that they call Kingdom Halls. And your typical Kingdom Hall has few or no windows for the most part. Now, some people might make a big deal about that, saying, why don't they have windows? Are they doing secret, weird stuff inside and they don't want us to see? Actually, their reasoning is that windows are more expensive to put into a building, and they just quickly put up a building as fast as they can, which I believe allows them to put more money into the Watchtower uh, Track Society in Brooklyn, New York. I think that's the real reason for it. They are forbidden to take a blood transfusion. Men are forbidden to wear beards. The Watchtower organization is God's prophet on earth today, and they must forego vacations to attend annual conventions. All Christian pastors are the Antichrist, and all churches are of Satan, and God only speaks through the governing body in Brooklyn, New York. Very convenient for them. That'll come back to haunt them later. They teach that since God is controlling the printing presses of the Watchtower Track Society, that they can't make any mistakes, but we'll look into that. They also teach that only faithful Jehovah's Witnesses will survive Armageddon, and angels help God direct the Watchtower organization. If you leave the Jehovah's Witnesses or are expelled from their organization, you will not be resurrected. Only Jehovah's Witnesses' prayers are heard by God, according to them. If they have a non-witness spouse, their first loyalty is to the elders over their spouse. They must never enter a church building. They must never attend a church service, and that God will destroy all non-Jehovah's Witnesses at Armageddon. And when, when will that happen? Why don't you know? It already happened. It happened in the year 1975. Don't some of you remember that? We'll get to more of that later. They can never question what is printed in Watchtower literature. They must report their witnessing activities to their elders. Here is their kingdom interlinear translation of the Greek scriptures. Now keep in mind that their headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, cannot make a mistake. And they printed this book. So I'm going to show you a screenshot of one of the pages in that book. This happens to be a section of Revelation chapter 7. On the left is a Greek text the Jehovah's Witnesses went with the critical Greek text of Westcott and Hort, which were two Catholic guys that worshipped statues of Mary. I kid you not, they talk about it in their memoirs. On the right hand of the page is the translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible, which they call the New World Translation. It sounds very ominous, like the New World Order. And we have found in their New World Translation the word worshipped. This is happening up in heaven where Jehovah God is worshipped by everybody there, angels and cherubim, you name it. As a Christian, we have no problem with that. We understand that God is going to be worshipped. So everything is fine with that. Uh, but let's take a look right on the same page, their little Greek interlinear. Consulting their interlinear on the left side, you'll see that this Greek word for the word worshipped, is puka nuav. Now, that's not exactly how you pronounce it, but I don't really care. Remember, you don't learn anything by studying the dead language of Greek, and my God is a God of the living. So, if I get to make fun of a Greek word every now and then, that's fun. And that's fine, because when I make fun of this word, it will help you to recognize it later when you see it pop up again. Uh, so, we see this puka nuav, they say, should be translated worshipped, and their translation translates it just fine. But when you're back in Matthew chapter 14, this time we're talking about Jesus Christ, Jesus has just calmed the storm, and the disciples worship him because of that. They're amazed. However, in the Jehovah's Witnesses New World Translation, it says that the disciples did obeisance to him. It's a little hyphenated word there, obeisance. 
Obeisance means to bow. So they bowed. Had they been girls, they would have curtsied. They they bowed. Now, bowing is a form of respect. I'll grant you that, but it's nowhere near on the same level as worshiping. But guess what their own interlinear says about them? Why it tells on them. It says that that puka nuav should be obeisance. But remember, in Revelation, they had no problem with puka nuav, meaning worshipped. And so I'm going to cut and paste both of those instances and show them side by side. The one on top is from Revelation when it was Jehovah God getting the worship, but they won't allow Jesus to be worshipped. They instead just have him being bowed to. They diminish Jesus. Their very own book tells on them. They're not telling the truth. I submit to you that somebody is lying to you. Now, it ain't me. Now, I'm not lying. They are. Let's take the phrase, I am. That's the phrase God used of himself when he was talking to Moses. We Christians also know that Jesus referred to himself as I am in the Gospel of John. But when we go to check out that same verse in the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible, we see that they have incorrectly translated that phrase as I have been. And yet, once again, in their very own Greek interlinear, they show the phrase in Greek, ego imai, should be translated as I am, but they wouldn't dare let Jesus be on equal footing with God. So, what do you do when the Jehovah's Witnesses come knocking at your door? Well, what you should do is listen closely to them. And they're going to want to hand you magazines. They'll even ask you for money to cover the cost of the magazines. They're required to buy many copies of the Watchtower magazine and distribute them. This is a financial burden on them, and they soon learn to not be bashful when asking you for a donation to help them out. After they've said their opening dialogue, ask to see their Bible that they're holding. The reason is... They have been trained to not listen to a word you say. They've been told that you Christians are working for the devil, and you can't possibly have the truth. But the Jehovah's Witnesses read. They read all the time. They don't listen, but they read. They constantly read the Watchtower material. So when you have their Bible in your hands, you can show them things. Literally put your finger on the page and show them. Now here in Acts chapter 9 from their Bible, there was in Damascus a certain disciple named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, rise, go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man named Saul from Tarsus, for look, he is praying. And in the vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands upon him that he might recover sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how many injurious things he did to your holy ones in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to put in bonds all those calling upon your name. Now point to that phrase, all those calling upon your name. Make sure that you stick that right in their face so they can read it. They, they're they trained not to listen to you. So you make them see it with their own eyes. So Ananias went off and entered into the house, and he laid his hands upon him and said, Saul, brother, the Lord, the Jesus that appeared to you on the road over which you were coming, has sent me forth in order that you may recover sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That right there ought to be enough to explain that Jesus is Lord, but they may have a way to wiggle around that. So you'll have to repeat it for them a whole bunch of times. You show them that Ananias called him Lord, and they'll say, big deal, that's a, that's a capital L, but it's a small lowercase O-R-D. And anytime the word Lord has capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that should be Jehovah. And so they don't mind that Jesus is called Lord here. And you'll move along with them. Just keep showing them stuff. 
you just say here, it says, the Lord, the Jesus has sent me. And they were calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, my Bible on the left in Romans 10, 13 says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, lowercase o-r-d, shall be saved. And that's Jesus. If you call upon Jesus, you'll be saved. In their Bible, the New World Translation, they changed the word Lord to Jehovah. However, their Greek in a linear says Kyrios, the Greek word there, is Lord, capital L, small O-R-D, and then it's Lord. But in Romans, they have the same word, Kyrios, Lord, lowercase O-R-D, and yet they have changed it to Jehovah. They are trying to hide the fact that Jesus is Lord. Now, this may not really convince them right away. It takes a while to convince them. They may try and get you sidetracked by telling you that there is no hell, and your soul does not go to hell because the word soul is just a fancy way or a polite, poetic way of saying your body. But that just proves that they don't know how to handle Scripture correctly. So use their Bible. Take them to Genesis chapter 35, where Rachel is dying shortly after giving birth to Benjamin. And show them, point to these words. And the result was that as her soul was going out, because she died, she called his name Benani, but his father called him Benjamin. That word soul can't possibly be the body. How can her body leave her body? Where, where's her body getting up and going when it dies? It's not. Also, take them over to Matthew, where Jesus is talking. Jesus says, do not become fearful of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Or wait a minute, did Jesus mean to say, don't be afraid of those who can, who can kill the body, but cannot kill the body? No, that's ridiculous. You have a body, spirit, and soul, and your soul can go to hell if you're not careful. Get them back on the real subject. What's the real subject? Why, it's their salvation, because you're worried about them. Don't argue right away. Remember, we want them to see Christ in us. Their presentation takes um, a few minutes, maybe two or three, depending on how fast they spit it out. They may not have too much experience getting to say it all without some door being closed in their face. So they'll be happy that you're letting them talk. Instead of out and out disagreeing with them right away, just say nice things like, please go on. When they are finished, Ask if you might share something. They usually agree if they're going to be cordial. So have your Bible marked with 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Now we're going to read that in our Bible. This picture is going to show you two guys. You're, you're, you're basically the guy on the left. And the Jehovah's Witness showed up at your door on the right. Point out that there is a Bible test as to whether we are in the true faith or not. And that's in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves. Whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Now, the reason we use our Bible on this one is because we want them to see if you want to be in the correct faith, and they desperately want to be in the correct faith. You have to have Jesus Christ in you. If we were going to use their Bible, they have already altered this because they didn't like it. They have that Christ is in union with you. That means just, you know, he simply agrees with you. Well, big deal. In their own interlinear, it tells on them once again that they're not translating it correctly. It should be Christ in you. But get them back to your Bible. Tell them you are happy to testify that you do not fail the test, for Jesus Christ is indeed in you. Then tell them your testimony of the indwelling Christ and how your conversion came about. An ideal situation would be them asking you for more information, or better yet, asking you how to get saved. More than likely, they're probably not going to say that right at this point. They'll remain calm, even though you may have gotten through to them enough to shake them up a bit. But it's going to take a while. 
they will probably want to leave some literature with you. Take it. When they're gone, you can always throw it away. At least they didn't give it to someone else who might actually have read it. Now, I won't spend too much time on their artwork, but a lot of it is very creepy. I'll show you what I mean. Here, They always want to paint pictures of the judgment, the end of the world, and everybody's in a panic and being killed. And But they're not. They're happy. They're, they're surviving just fine. And they're thrilled, and they're always well-dressed. So while we're getting killed by God because we're the evil church or the evil Christians, they are living in a peaceful new world. And they don't believe that they go to heaven. They believe they are going to live on paradise earth. Here in their book, uh, You Can Live Forever in Paradise on Earth, a man comes home from work, and instead of seeing his wife, he seems to be able to check out that little statuette of this ram, which, you know, some might say that's Ares, the god of war in Greek. It's, you can't really prove anything by this picture. It is just kind of weird and creepy. Here in their book, Revelation, it's grand climax at hand. Boy, the word hand is definitely noted here because as we zoom in on this hand that he just handed John something, we see someone's face. It's just creepy. Now, I don't know if that would be considered demonic artwork or not, but why is it in there? Why are their own artists seem to be making fun of them? Speaking of their artwork, a long time ago, here's about a hundred year old artwork of theirs. They had the crown and the cross symbol. Now I'm going to point out the cross to you because today they don't teach that Jesus was ever on a cross, but they used to. In fact, it's all over their artwork. Today they teach the crazy idea that Jesus was crucified on a stake, kind of like what the Assyrians used to do. They'll resort to anything to be a little bit different than us Christians, or to say that we Christians got it wrong. Uh, they'll tell you that the word for the cross didn't really mean a cross until a few hundred years later. They're getting that wrong. It's, it's a shame that we don't have a Bible, a real Bible, where we could ask the Bible any question we wanted to when it comes to dealing with these cults. Fortunately for me, I do have a Bible. And my Bible answers this question. You say, where does it answer it? Well, when Jesus appeared after the resurrection to the disciples, Thomas was not there at first. And they tell Thomas all about it later. And Thomas makes that wonderful quote that we can still remember, except I shall see in his hands... See the word hands? Hands is plural. The print of the nails. See that word, nails? It's plural. So, instead of a stake, where you're using one nail to go through both hands, you hold the hands one on top of each other and drive that nail through it, you couldn't really have much room to get a second nail in there. So if he's going to be crucified on a stake, they would use one nail. But here, Thomas knows how Jesus was crucified. He knows that each hand, plural, had its own individual nail, making it plural, one for each hand. I'm so glad we have a Bible. I'm so glad we can ask that Bible anything, and it will clear up all kinds of of nonsense that other cults come about. Jesus was obviously crucified on a cross, one hand stretched out from the other. Also, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't seem to understand the word picture or the, the mental image that the book of Exodus was giving us when the Passover happened. Here we have a picture of a man applying the blood. Now he's applying it at the top, and I have no problem understanding that I imagine some of that blood dropped from the top all the way down. There's your one up and down motion. But when he applies on the left and the right side of the doorway, he doesn't even realize what he's doing, but he is signifying a cross. And so you've got a motion of the blood going from the top to the bottom. And when they applied the blood, they went from left to right, or maybe they did the right side first. But they made a cross in their doorway. 
And to top it all off, Jesus declared that he himself is the door. So the Jehovah's Witness that says he was crucified on a stake, they're missing this obvious picture that the Lord was putting in their minds. Now, my Bible is really great. And it says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they saw that word coming. They saw it in my Bible. And they liked it so much that they decided they would set a date for when Jesus was coming back. And they did. They told everybody it's going to happen in the year 1914. And how did they get that wonderful number? They got it not by looking at the Bible. No, they got it from a study of the Great Pyramid. They measured the angles and sides of the pyramid, and then they matched it up with the history timeline of the world. And they came to the conclusion, based upon the measurements of a building, that the world would come to an end in 1914. Now, I like studying the Great Pyramid myself. I think it's a great representation of the universe because it kind of has four dimensions, the height, the width, the length, and the depth, and all that. But we're not going to talk about any of that now. I would never declare that the world's going to come to an end based on the measurements of a building. But they did. And guess what? When 1914 came and went, they had a problem. When the world governments weren't destroyed by Jesus in 1914, the Jehovah's Witnesses had quite the problem on their hands, so they admitted that they had made a mistake in their math, and they kind of tried to laugh it off. They said that when they added up the years of mankind's history, they neglected to remove the zero when you go from B.C. to A.D., and that they were off by one year. So we goofed, but hey, the real the real end is going to come in 1915. So you all should get prepared and go out there and spread all the watchtower tracks you can. Well, guess what? In 1915, that day came and went, and they said, no, we were wrong. It, it must be 1918. And this time he's going to destroy those lousy Christian churches, especially the ones that are making fun of us because we're setting dates. Well, as we all know, 1918 came and went. And then they said, well, it's got to be 1925. And this time they used the word probably. They're getting a little better, but they're still totally, totally off. When it got to be the year 1943, they shifted the blame from them to God. Now, they didn't do that out and out rightly, but they did, matter of fact, by the way they said things. It, it said they declared in 1943 that God is the real author of the Watchtower magazine. So that's like saying, don't get mad at us for setting these dates. After all, it's God who's doing the writing, not us. And in 1968, they warned everybody that the world would end in 1975. And they even started a countdown. Just think, only 19 months left. So 1975 is when they said the world would come to an end. Now, how did they cover their mistakes? Easy. They just did what every college professor does at every seminary. You blame the translation. Remember, I showed you our Bible and it used the word coming well, they decided that the Greek word for coming, here we go again, had some wiggle room in it. So they changed the word coming into the word presence. Now, instead of Jesus coming to us visibly, they teach that he came invisibly and that the Jehovah's Witnesses merely feel his presence, not his coming. They claimed that they were correct all along in their date setting and that Jesus did everything up in heaven, invisibly, back in 1914. And it was invisible to us here on earth. So instead of seeing Jesus come back, we just feel his presence. And they say that Jesus will never be seen visibly again here on earth. So if you find yourself in a conversation with a JW, be sure to ask him, if Christ will not have a visible return to earth, then how will he be seen by all the tribes of the earth, according to their own Bible, Revelation 1, 7? 
And we see in their New World Translation in Matthew 24, everybody sees Jesus. So we have Matthew on the left and Revelation on the right. It says, every eye will see him. In fact, the book of Revelation, in their version, tells us to look. Look with your eyes. I've circled it here so you can see it. And make sure that JW you're talking to, make sure he sees this word, look. Now, how are you going to see something there with your eyes if they teach he's going to be invisible? Even their Bible in Hebrews tells us that he will appear a second time to those who are earnestly looking for him. Well, what do you know about that? They claim that Jesus is actually Michael, the archangel. They teach that Jesus was just a man who becomes Christ when he's water baptized. Take them over to the book of Jude, and Jude only has one chapter. So in verse 9 of Jude, in their Bible, show them that Michael did not rebuke the devil. Point to the words. See, they're talking about Michael. He did not rebuke the devil. He didn't tell the devil to get lost. He deferred that to the Lord being able to do that, but not him. So if they declare that Michael is actually Jesus, how come in their own Bible, that how come Jesus seems to have this power that Michael doesn't? In their own version of Matthew chapter 4, it says, Jesus said to them, go away, Satan. So he's rebuking Satan, telling him to get lost. Michael didn't do that. How can Michael and Jesus be the same? Well, obviously they're not. Ask them, are you allowed to believe the Bible when it disagrees with something you read in the Watchtower magazine? For example, I've heard that Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus raised his physical human body, even though the Bible says that Jesus promised to raise the body that the Jews destroyed. In their version, take them to John chapter 2, in their own Bible, where it says, In answer, Jesus said to them, Break down this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Therefore the Jews said, This temple was built in 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was talking about the temple of his body. It is a bodily resurrection. Ask them if Jesus did not receive his authority as king of God's kingdom until 1914. Why did Jesus claim that after his resurrection, all authority has been given me in heaven and on earth? If all authority was given to Christ at his resurrection, what authority was left for him to receive in 1914? Now, they may reply, yes, he did say that. But that doesn't mean that Jesus began his kingdom rule then. It only means that he was given the authority over the Christian congregation of his followers at that time. So you tell them, so let me get this straight. Are you saying that Christ's rulership and authority that was given to him at his resurrection was limited to the Christian congregation until 1914 when he gained rulership over the earth? And they'll say, that's right. The Watchtower Society says in their book, Knowledge That Leads to Everlasting Life, that Jesus knew his rulership over the earth was reserved for the future, long after his resurrection and ascension to heaven. They will continue to say, King David said in Psalm 110, Sit at my right hand until I place your enemies as a stool for your feet. This means that his rulership would not start right away but later when the kingdoms of the earth would be made into his footstool. And as you read in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, But this man offered one sacrifice for sins perpetually and sat down at the right hand of God, from then on awaiting until his enemies should be placed as a stool for his feet. Sounds pretty good, but you say, So, who are these enemies of Jesus? And they'll say, why, they must be the earthly and worldly governments here on earth. Ask him to read for you. Would you read 1 Corinthians 15, 24 for me out of your New World Translation? Now, he may get kind of tired of this, but he, he might go along with it. He'll say, okay. Next, the end, when he, when he hands over the kingdom to his God and Father, when he has brought to nothing all governments and all authority and power. 
Now you thank him for that. Tell him thank you. Now please read two more verses for me. Stay in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but read verses 25 and 26. So he'll read and he says, For he must rule as king until God has put all enemies under his feet, as the last enemy death is to be brought to nothing. Now, according to those verses, what is the last enemy that is going to be put under Jesus' feet? Well, it says the last enemy is death. Since the Bible tells us that Jesus is waiting at the right hand of God until his enemies will be put under his feet, and since 1 Corinthians 15 says that the last enemy is death, doesn't this mean that Jesus is still waiting at the right hand of God? Well... We still have death running around. Jesus couldn't have returned yet because the last enemy death hasn't been destroyed yet. And they have no real answer to that. That doesn't mean they won't try and come up with an answer or change the subject. Your job is not necessarily being victorious in this argument, nor are you likely going to succeed in leading him to the real Jesus. But you are hoping to at least shake him up and make him go back to his kingdom hall. And there he'll ask a bunch of questions to his superiors, and they won't have satisfactory answers for him. Then hopefully he'll be responsive to the next Christian that comes along. 